five. I believe that's the official time, Mountain Standard Time. Uh, school board members, good to see you. Uh, I think Mrs. Dima Carey will join us. Uh, but this is September the 22nd. And welcome to all those that are coming online. Uh, we appreciate you being here. This is a study session of the board, and I'll call it to order now. Uh, and we will uh, begin with a roll call. And let's start us off, Sandra Kidman. Sandra Kidman here. Thank you. Ed Franklin. D Desiree Fowler, board clerk. Okay, thank you. And uh, Dee McClary, as I said, should be joining us. Uh, Mr. Superintendent, we've got it. We've got to hear your voice. Right here. Good evening. All right. Good evening. Good to have you in the house. And we've got Lynn Hoffman joining us uh, with several presenters tonight. We've got a full agenda. And so I think we need to get this going. This, again, this is a work study session and we'll just kick it right off. Uh, the first item uh, presentation, Google Classroom, Ryan Palazzi, you have got it. Mr. Wallen, board members, thank you guys. Um, again, I was here, uh, seems like a while ago, but uh, my name is Ryan Polizzi and I'm actually now teaching social studies at the middle school, sixth grade. Um, before that, I was the remote learning mentor representative from Desert View. Um, I was asked by Mr. Wallen a couple of weeks ago um, to kind of give you guys a Google rundown. And I think today he wants me to nail down Google Classroom a little bit more specifically. Um, so that is what I'm going to show you today. Um, I'll tell you guys that I ran a few different trainings for our substitute teachers in the district about similar things and it took pretty much the entire day and I'm going to try to keep this brief to about 15 minutes. Um, if there's anything that you guys want more information about, please just stop me and ask. Um, I'm happy to do it. I'm happy to stop and take any questions. I am going to roll through it pretty quickly. Obviously, you guys don't have to run your own Google Classroom. You just kind of want to see what's going on. Um, so I'm just going to kind of go through some things quickly. So if I have the permission to share my screen, I'm hoping I can do that. I've never, never shared my screen on Zoom before. Are you guys all able to see my screen right now? All right, I'm hoping so, cool. No one said no, so. <laughs> All right, so this is our Google Classroom homepage. Um, obviously for me, it looks a lot different just because I am a teacher in a lot of different classes. Um, I was made a teacher on all of the Desert View teachers classes. Um, so those are still on here, but all of the teachers at the high school and middle school, they're gonna have each of their periods broken up into different Google Classrooms. Um, and that for, the, for that reason, we're using the Google Meets for that one specific time period. So right now you can see at the middle school level, um, I'm gonna zoom in so you guys can see this. Um, for the middle school, we have our time frames on our Google Classroom, just as a reminder to the students of when they need to be going to each of those classes, um, as well as the periods marked on there. And I'm sure things are being done similarly at the high school. Um, the students view is gonna look similar to this. Um, at a middle school and high school level, they're going to have all their tiles for all of their different classes. Um, there are ways to archive classes and kind of store them if they were in Google Classrooms from previous years, um, but all of their classes for the current year will show up. Um, at Desert View, I know that the students have their one main Google Classroom page, and they'll also have other tiled, for, other tiled classrooms for their specials classes, which they go to once a week. Um, so most of our students have a good number of these classes, and I can definitely tell you guys that um, the, some of the trouble, especially at Desert View, that we've been having is just navigating between these, um, just because if you can look here, I got second period from 818 to 856, and then five minutes later, the kids need to be over here in third period. So as you can see, there's a lot of navigating between different things. I know that this is going way more seamlessly than it was before, especially at the elementary level, but this is Something that takes time, because like I said, the kids are kind of having to bounce back and forth between a few different things. Um, so like I said, this is the main page. This plus button up here is how you create or join a class. Um, depending on the permissions that you have for your Google account, um, you're able to create or join. Obviously, the students are just joining a class. Um, this is the page that they get. This is the class code that they put in at the beginning of the year. Um, but obviously, at this point, most of our students are already enrolled in a class. 
Um, so I'm going to go ahead and take you to, I have a lot of examples I can show you guys. This is um, a little bit bare bones just because I just started teaching social studies at the middle school. Um, so this is going to look a little bit more simplistic, um, but this is our Google Classroom main page. Um, this is what it's going to look like um, no matter what. It's pretty much always going to look like this. I know, like I said, at the middle school and high school level, we have the time periods uh, for those classes posted on here. Um, and then obviously the title with the periods specified on there. Class code is always visible right there. And then this Google Meet link um, for each class is how the students are getting to class every day. Um, obviously at the middle school and high school, that's looking a little bit different than it is at Desert View. Desert View, they're staying on with that teacher pretty much the entire day until unless they're going to specials. Um, teachers are able to customize these backgrounds. You'll see a lot of different ones. Some teachers have added some animation, making things a little bit more engaging for the students, which is cool. Um, on this left hand side, kind of just walking you through this main page. Um, this is the stream. I should mention that the stream is I think the best way to think of the stream is like a Facebook page where your most recent events just come first. Um, this is where teachers are posting daily learning intentions. Um, and like I said, I'm going to show you plenty of those examples. I'm going to kind of be bouncing back and forth between a few. Um, I'll go ahead and show you a, a high school level um, thing right here. Like I said, this is the kind of like the main page of the classroom. Not many assignments are getting posted to the stream. They might be linked to the stream but those bulk of the bulk of those things are living in this classwork tab. Um, again, you can see the success criteria, the agenda for the day, the expectations of asynchronous time is usually posted on here too, as well as the learning intentions. Um, this is a spot for, for quick announcements that the students need to get information for. Um, if the internet ever goes down, this is a great place to toss into the stream. Hey guys, you know, the, the, my internet's not working today. I need you to do this, this, and this. It's more of an announcement section um, than anything else, but um, assignments are also linked when you show up here as well. Like you guys can see on mine, I posted a few different things and it's just, it's like a, it posts as a reminder. On this left hand side, for each class is the upcoming assignments that are becoming due for the students. Um, one of the things that has been challenging is this will, this section right here will only show. Um, what is due for that class unless the students go to a different page to see all of their work. Um, so I know that that's one of the things that's been challenging for the students um, is just navigating all of the assignments that they have due just because they are in different Google classrooms. Um, there are ways to do that through Google Calendar, but that is one of the things that uh, some of the feedback that I've heard. Am I going too fast? Are we doing okay? I have a question. Yes, ma'am. So have you introduced kids to the Google to-do list? Because that, for me as a parent, was an absolute revelation. There's a to-do list that a student goes to the Google to-do list in classroom. It shows all their assignments, no matter yes, if it's okay. classwork, bell work, because that seems to be the easiest things for kids to navigate what they're actually all their to find all their assignments in one place. Yes. So there is a few what you're speaking of is these sections right here. There are a few different ways for the students to organize what assignments they have. Just being honest with you, I've been at Desert View for the majority of my time with all this. And I know that the students only pretty much have one section of material that they have to organize. Um, but it goes back to a lot of our avid strategies with the, ca I think the calendar and the to-do list, what you were talking about. Um, I'm going to have a ton on here just because I'm in a ton of different classes. Um, but this is where, as you were speaking, the students are able to see all of their assignments that they have due. Um, this is a new feature. This was not here in the past. Um, Google is always updating these things. So it is nice to see that they have that option now. Um, again, like I said, the calendar is something that I'm going to be pushing my students to do. And I know that we're working on at the middle school a lot. I can't speak to the high school, but I'm sure that these students are being are using this calendar option. And the, the nice part about Google is it all syncs and communicates with itself. You know, if you're on your Gmail, you guys might know this. If you're on your Gmail, on the right hand side, you can pull up your calendar and the students can do the same thing where they're seeing what they have going on that day, what assignments are due that day in their Gmail. And they also are able to access that through here. Um, one common theme that I've kind of been saying um, in any training that I've done is if you have an objective in Google, if you're trying to accomplish anything, 
there's probably five or six different ways to accomplish the same task. It's just about ease and then it's about how the students are going to do that and how you're going to train them to do that. So yeah, there is a lot of ways. The to do, the to review, and the calendar are all different ways that the students can track um, and monitor what they have coming up. So that's pretty much the stream. Like I said, the, the majority of what the kids are using the stream for is just to get to this meet link. Um, at the middle school level, we are also posting office hours um, as a separate meet link, which is going well just because you can't really open. I have six periods during the day. I can't open six different Google Meets and track who's in what. So we have one common um, office hours link that we're using for an hour and a half each day to do small groups and uh, work one on one with students, get students caught up, things like that. And that's where this is, at least for me, posted is in this section of the Google Classroom. Um, but again, that's the stream. I'm going to take you guys over to the classwork section and I'll show you a couple of different examples. Um, this, these are topics on the left hand side, and these are being organized differently across our entire school district. Um, I'm, I know at Desert View, things are getting better, better organized. Um, at the middle school and high school, I, I am one of the things that I've heard from students, just because I work with high school students for coaching, is they're having a really tough time navigating how these things are being organized. Um, just because, you know, for me, I, I'm posting material by week. And obviously, I've only been with my students for one week at the middle school, um, but I'm posting materials by, by week. So this is all the stuff that we did this week or I'm going to do this week. I have my links. And then obviously, I missed the first month with my kiddos. So I have all of our first month stuff that they were working on before. Um, I'm going to show you, I think, probably the best way to do this. Um, I'm going to show you a third grade teacher who's organizing hers in a different way. So it, it might look like a lot, but you guys have to know that there's just so much, everything with their school is in this. Um, I really like how this third grade group is doing it. And what's nice is all of the third grade teachers are doing this the exact same way. Um, what they will do is for this current week, so this week is obviously the 21st and 22nd, they will move this topic to the top so that students are not having to scroll all the way down to get the material that they need. So Tuesday stuff's right here, Monday stuff's right here. Then when this week is over, they will create a new topic similar to what you see here and then organize the material and kind of drag it down, drag it up. Um, you are able to move these things around. And I think that's really helped some of our younger kiddos just tracking some of where these things are. Because as you can tell, I mean, this is a third grade class and there is a lot of stuff on here. So we, ha we had to decide, and I think the third grade team did the best job that I've seen um, organizing all this material. And you can add these emojis, which I think really helps, honestly helps the kids engage with it, something as simple as that. Um, any questions about that? I think one of the biggest things, like I said, that I'm seeing is just the way that we're organizing some of these things can be, it, it was one of the things that was loose in our tight and loose document for Google Classroom. Um, and I know some of the high school kids, it's just, it's organized in different ways. And hopefully by now, these students, especially at the high school level are figuring some of these things out. Um, but that's just one of the things I wanted to share is there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, I do like how this one is organized, especially because, you know, we're two months into school. We have a lot of content that's been, that's been given to the kids. Um, so that's the topics. Um, like I said, you can move and drag these around again. Here's the meet link the Google Calendar link, and then all the Clash Drive folder, all the material that's been posted, it organizes them into Google Drive as well. Um, when the teachers are creating assignments or posting things, they have a few different options. Um, an assignment is just gonna be a straightforward assignment. I'll get to that in a second. A quiz assignment is going to link to a Google Forms. Um, a question is more for a discussion, a quick type of discussion. Um, and then material is for useful links, um, classroom links that the kids might be using every day or videos. And then you also have the option to create a topic here as well. Um, I'm going to show you guys really quick what assignments look like. I'm going to go back to mine again. This is on the left hand side. This is the main menu. I have a million classes in here. The students do not have this many. Um, so I posted my first assignment for my kids, uh, my social studies kids yesterday. Um, and you can tell on the left hand side what type of assignment it is based on the icon. Um, and again, those icons are right here. The material one just looks like this quiz assignment and assignment. Um, so this was the first assignment that I had the kids do. 
Um, I'm all about UDL and making different types of assignments. So I, and this is being done a lot. And I think that's one of the biggest benefits of using Google Classroom and our Google resources is it's so easy to differentiate. It's so easy to create um, universal designed lessons um, for kids to then make choices as to how they're gonna show what they learned. Um, so I had a quick introduction that I went through with my kids and then they just had to choose whether they were gonna do a Google Forms to show me what they learned or a Google Slides. Um, but what's nice about this is you can view who's turned what in, um, who's done what thing. I can tell who's done a Google Slide, who's done a Google Form. Um, I also have the link to the Google Form right here. This one looks a little bit different just because um, the students had the option to choose one of the two. And this hasn't, this is due Friday, so the students haven't quite finished it yet. Um, but what's nice is when you are creating an assignment, so I go to create assignment, this is what the teachers are doing almost every day. Um, when you go to, I'm just gonna add something on here so you guys can see as an example of how the teachers are doing this. Um, Cause this is one of the coolest things that you can do with Google Classroom. I'm gonna just show you with a practice slideshow that I just randomly found. Um, this, the teachers are gonna give it a title, give it instructions. Um, you're gonna have the option to add all kinds of things on here, files from your computer, Google Drive, things that are saved there, YouTube videos for reminder lessons. Um, this has an exclamation mark on it just because I don't actually have access to post this material. Um, but what I can do in these three options, I think are one of the most important things about all of Google Classroom is the options that you have when you're giving kids assignments. So this is a Google slide. It could be anything, a Google Doc, a Google Sheet, a Google Form, maybe not a Google Form just because that's a quiz, but for Google Slides, I think Google Slides is what I use the most. If I have the option checked here to, and this is the default, for students to view the file, they're just gonna be able to look at it. So this option is mostly for direct teaching and direct instruction type thing, uh, lectures at the high school level, things like that. If you choose this one, students can edit file. That's going to be all of the students that you send this to will be able to edit the same document, um, which teachers get scared to do. I'm going to be honest with you, but just because all the kids will be working on one thing. But if you're able to successfully facilitate group work, um, this can go really well. You know, you can assign one specific thing to one group of kids, or if you design a lesson that has different levels attached to it you can scaffold that and assign that content to the specific kids at their level. Um, so that's really nice, um, a really nice feature that I, I'm hoping we use a little bit more as people get a little bit more comfortable with this platform. Um, and the final one on here is make a copy for each student, which is basically just gonna give it to them as independent work. Um, so I like to think of this as direct instruction, group work, independent work. Um, and these three options, like I said, are some of the most important things that you can do in Google Classroom. Um, what's so nice about what I'm doing is I have five periods of social studies and I'm teaching the same thing five times. I don't have to go to my separate classrooms and post them separately. I have the option of posting the same assignment to all of my social studies classes, which is really, really nice. Um, I can select all of them. I don't have to do it one at a time. And then from there, once, once I have one selected, I'm able to select which students are able to see and work on that. So if I have these five, these five students right here and they're at one skill level and I want to have them collaborate on something, I can go student can edit file and I'm just gonna send it to these five. So just those five kids are able to work on it, um, which is like I said, really great for differentiation, things like that. Points, you're able to assign point value, due date, um, and then put it and organize it into a topic that's already in your Google Classroom. Um, you can schedule these things Teachers are able to assign it directly, scheduled it, or they can save it as a draft and post it later. Um, this is really nice for lesson planning. You don't have to post it the night that you're doing it. You can schedule it to post in the morning so students aren't working ahead or seeing things that they don't need to see quite yet. Um, and that kind of takes us to the next section on here. I'm going to skip the people one for now. Um, the grades one, obviously mine's going to look pretty blank because I haven't quite done the grade stuff yet. Um, I know that this transfers very easily into PowerSchool, which is obviously where we're keeping most of our grades. Um, you're able to see all your students for that class, what they're missing, um, what they have done, what they've turned in, what they've turned in late. Um, I know that one of the big things that we're working on the kids with is, um, you know, they'll do the assignment, but they have to actually go turn it in. 
and that's um, a video that I actually had to make and we had to send it all to tell the students because they're sitting there saying, oh, I did it, but they actually have to physically go in there and turn it in. Um, but you are able to track their work in real time, which I think is another one of the coolest things about this is you're able to come in here and see in real time how each of these kids are working on each specific assignment, uh, which is one of, again, one of the cooler features about this. Um, the last section on here is just the people section. Um, you're able to add teachers um, the admins are all on and the SATs are all teachers in these. Um, and then the students are able to connect their parents and guardians to monitor um, their work through the class. Um, one of the big things I'm pushing for at the middle school is getting, trying to get all of our parents and guardians on here as a member of their students. <laughs> We're getting okay. there. Thanks. I'm trying to give it, make Actually, it an incentive, <laughs> um, but we're getting there. Um, what's nice about this though, is once the students connect or once the parents connect to their student account once, it, it connects to all of the classes that they're a part of. So the teachers don't have to sit here and invite all the guardians for all of their classes. Once the students connect once, um, they're able to, uh, to, make, to have their parents be on there for their whole Google Classroom. So that is the quick rundown of Google Classroom. That was like the fastest I could possibly try to talk. <laughs> what questions can I answer for you guys? That was super fast. Board members, do you have anything? You parents, at, at Desiree and uh, Sandra, you guys are probably for, pretty familiar with what he's been talking about. Because you guys do all your schoolwork for your kids, is that right? <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah, I can't help me. Nice. The, the parents are able to get the apps, um, right, get right. notifications, all that good stuff. I know that it can be a lot when you have like two different students, one at the middle school, one at the high school, and you're seeing all their assignments, but just holds them accountable, right? <laughs> oh boy, it does. Now I do have a question, probably, I, I, I know that all this is taken care of, but with all of the information, all the data that's being put in there, the backup system on this thing, I mean, is it bulletproof? I think that's a that's going to be a Brian question. Um, I know that Google is constantly, especially right now in the remote learning world, they're constantly doing updates, improvements. Um, I know Google Meets is getting updated very soon, um, kind of just sharing some of these things up. What's so nice though is is Google Drive saves almost everything automatically. It's right. it's really it's almost harder to try to lose something than it is to actually lose something. So. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of backups, there's a lot of fail safes, but at the end of the day, all we really need to do is be able to connect to our kids. And I think the Google Meets has been going a lot better in the last month um, than the first month, just with all the all the internet stuff and all that connectivity. Thing that going right, on. great. Pop, I have a question. Yeah, yeah, go. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I got booted off two or three times while you're doing your presentation. So I missed the part of the connecting parents to Google Classroom. How successful have parents been connecting to Google Classroom? Can you see that from your side point? So you are able to see in each of your classes uh, which parents have connected. Um, the most important thing to remember, I think, and this might need to be reminded to the teachers, especially at the middle school and high school, is the parents only have to connect to their student's account one time. Um, you don't have to connect to each class. Once the guardians and parents are connected to the student's account, it goes to all of the classes that they're a part of. And they get all of the information of, of, the, of what their student is in class, if that makes sense. Okay, so the, the, like, reason, the reason why I'm asking is because I have five kids in the district and I haven't been able to connect to Google Classroom at all. And I was wondering if I'm just an, a not, you know, if there's, you have numbers on how many parents have actually been able to connect in to Google Classroom. I do not have those numbers. I know one of the things that I've spent a lot of time looking on Google Forms and Google Support is parents, sorry, parents and guardians are not able to directly connect to their student's class unless they have the okay, class. Yeah, I under no, I understand that, but I can't, I can't even connect to my student's account. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. They have to be, you have to provide the teacher with your email 
And then the I teacher know. has to send you an email because yep. most students' emails are outside of the school district. The good, the class code thing doesn't work. So your students and, and I, are having to provide the, the teachers with their parents' emails. And I understand all that. And I have done that with several teachers and it still hasn't, I still haven't been able to connect. They sent me invites and so forth. And it's, so that's, that's why I'm curious, you know, is it me or do, do are parents having problems across the board or how many parents do we have that want to do that, that kind of thing? Yeah, that's a great question. I would, I would be very curious to see the numbers. Like I said, I actually spent some time today talking to the middle school leadership team about having there be some kind of contest about which homeroom class can get the most parents to connect, making it. I, I find in my time working here, if you incentivize the students to get their parents to do something, it's way better than us as the district trying to get the parents to do something. If you say to the oh, student, I would agree. you get a, you, you are the student and you get a prize, whatever it is. If your parents come to conferences or link to their Google classroom, I find there be, to be a lot more success with that. So that's kind of one of the things that I was talking to the middle school teachers about today. Oh, a little bit of extra credit will do it every time with my kids. I can tell you that if they even get as much as five points in the classroom, they will say, mom, you need to do this. So I... I would highly support that. Yeah, and I think, you know, we we use power school and that's where a lot of our teachers are, or a lot of our parents are seeing grades. But there, uh, you know, like just speaking for myself, when my parent, when I was a high school student and my parents were looking at my equivalent of power school, they weren't able to actually see what the assignment was, how I did on it. They weren't able to see any of those things. But now the, the, the parents are able to see exactly what's happening in the class. They're able to see what the students are working on. They're able to see when they turned it in and when they did it. That's huge. So the more parents that we can get connected, the, the better things are going to go and the more accountability there's going to be for students. Okay, great. Any other uh, questions, comments? Mr. Polizzi, thank you so much. That was awesome. And I uh, appreciate that. Keep, yes, keep up the good you work, right? Time. Feel free to send me any emails, anything you need. I'm happy to help out. Okay, thank you. Thanks, guys. All right, let's, let's move on my item B, and that's presentation. Uh, Chartwells, uh, Mr. Wallen, and Mr. Marquez. How are we all doing? Can we hear me all right? B beautiful. Perfect. All righty, uh, board members, uh, thank you for having me today. Uh, please excuse me as this is my first time presenting to the board. Um, so I'm here just to give you a basic overview of the financials from school year 2021. And if I could start, I will show you, I'll share my screen. Here we go, share screen. All right, share. There we go. Now, here we go. What we got here is a, uh, sorry, it doesn't have any more uh, flair to it, but we have a, a basic kind of real bare, not bare bones, but breakdown of our uh, school year food service wise. I'm going to see if I can make this a little bit smaller. That way I can get this all the way fit in. Here we go. That's your money there. Oh, they made it a little bit too small. All right. Apologies. All right. So starting from left to right, we're just going to go over uh, some of our just our meals sold. Now, I got it broken down into breakfast, lunch, summer meals, snacks, adults, and all our call, all our a la carte meals. So as you can see, our breakfast meals, we did uh, 199,000 break, uh, breakfast meals. This is uh, just regular school year uh, ending uh, in the middle of March when we left for spring break. Uh, we moved down to lunch right here. We did a total of 194,000 meals. Uh, summer meals, uh, we about tripled our summer meals from our um, budget because of what happened with COVID and we were able to start our summer food program uh, much earlier. So we ended up, that was our total meal count for starting June, um, excuse me, 
uh, March 23rd all the way to the end of June. Uh, moving down for just regular season, we have, uh, this is how many snacks, after school snacks we sold, uh, all the snacks we sell for all the enrichment after school. These are all our adult meals that we sold throughout the year. And a la carte meals, this is basically when we broke down all the a la carte sales and all the, um, yeah, all the a la carte revenue, and we divided it by uh, reimbursement, and that's how we get that number right there for a grand total of 464,000 meals for last year's. Uh, and please, anybody stop me if there's any questions or whatnot. Um, we have uh, expenditures right here in uh, for food service. This is all the salaries, district salaries right here um, for everybody who, who was part attached to the uh, food service. Uh, food service management. These is this right here is the total sum of uh, the total sum of invoices to Chartwells. Within this, there is uh, the food cost minus the rebates that uh, that are provided, uh, paper cost, administrative fees, uh, all the. Um, excuse me, the salaries for uh, our labor and my labor and all kinds of little uh, little bit of stuff. So there's stuff in there for advertising, training, uniforms, all that good stuff that's um, talked about in the agreement. Moving down right here, general supplies. It's just uh, supplies that we got around for the 510 account. So, you know, office supplies, uh, different uh, little things that we got to use for the food service. Uh, this right here is the freight for the USDA commodities. So all the, uh, the, the allotments that were awarded at the beginning of the year for, from the USDA, which is split between uh, DOD produce, uh, uh, brown box commodities, and uh, this one was processed uh, food. That's all the, the freight in it. Capital costs right here. This is all our stuff. So this has um, uh, upgrades for our POS system. This is the licensing for POS system and other pieces just as so. And other costs here are miscellaneous costs. So there's stuff in here where we had to purchase uh, things from for the food service department from like Amazon or Walmart or a transfer from another department. So then uh, that's we have a total expenditures here. So mind you, this is also coming from our 510 account um, uh, budget. So I look at it online through our visions and whatnot. And this is the this is an actual uh, hard numbers right here. Revenues, the good part right here. The beginning balance, this is what we brought, what was carried over from the 1819 school year, uh, 375K right there. This is the interest on all of that built up. Uh, food service right here, this is any um, money that was generated from food service, whether it was catering, a la carte, cash sales. That is all put in there, uh, cash sales from a la carte, adult sales and whatnot that's put in there. Other revenues, these are miscellaneous revenues. They are not accounted for in sales or cash sales. And down here, this is what our reimbursements that we had received, uh, like uh, basically checks from the federal government that received for our reimbursements of 992,000 for a total of 140,000, I'm sorry, $1,407,000. And that is our total revenue as we're looking at right now. Once again, these are hard numbers that we've gotten from uh, iVision. So these are, I'm not saying actual true numbers. I don't wanna put my foot in my mouth with Vindy watching, uh, but these are good numbers that we're working with right here. And that's just a little 
I guess, bare bones. Once again, please forgive me as it's my first time and my information might may not be a little bit, a little uh, light. Now, I mean, with, with when you start off a new year, uh, your carry, is that beginning balance, that's your carryover from the last year? That is correct, sir. Yes. Okay. So right now, are you, are you, is, if these are, is this is all you're dealing with, your carryover from here would be 30000 uh, there is different. I've actually got a different, uh, uh, sheet that I share with that has our carryover for this year. Okay. Uh, our carryover for this year is about 300,000 and okay. I don't have that on this computer right here. No, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. I just didn't. Okay. And, uh, the federal reimbursement, that's just title one reimbursement. Uh, I don't know if it would be called title one. This is, um, the US, the USDA AD reimbursements. Okay. All right. And that's what we got right there. Uh, I have a little bit of extra uh, information if you all would very much like to look at it, which I, this is information that I share with the business office every single month of uh, my financials that I record and do throughout the years. And if you, if you don't mind, I'll change the page right there. And I hope this is all right. I did. I failed to send this because I had to clean it up a little bit for everybody. But this is a um, a spreadsheet that I share with the business office every month, detailing all our expenditures and whatnot. And this is all the stuff that, all the things that cascade down into the uh, uh, invoices that that I provide from Chartwells. And with this. I actually have our NSLP reimbursements. There we go. Uh, for the for the uh, for the year right there, starting from uh, August of last year. And then, uh, so, were, are, were you sharing that with us so we could see it? I oh, did I, I did not share. I apologize. Hold on. No, no, no problem. No problem. Uh, give me a second here. I see it on my on my uh, on my computer, but I failed to share that. Hold on one second here. And then I will share screen. I apologize. Oh, we're going to go ahead and stop share. I'm going to share a different screen right here. Oh, once again, there we go. I apologize. Here we go. Oh, no problem. Now, here we go. Is it moving up and down? Perfect. Yep. So once again, here we go. These are all their expenses with our food purchased uh, rebates and all that stuff. And this is what I share with the business office every single month and we go through what our expenditures are and whatnot. Right here, we have our, uh, our oh, where are they? Here we go, our NSLP reimbursements right over here, NSLP reimbursements for every month. These come right off our claim sheets that we submit to ADE every single month. Gotcha. And for a grand total of uh, 1.1 million right there. And that's, once again, coming right off our, so at the end of the month when we, reconcile everything and we send our uh, claim sheets to uh, ADE, this is what the NOCP reimbursements for that month should be okay. cascading to this. Right here, we have all our prepayments, deposits, and whatnot. This, are, oh, here we got a little note right there. All our cart and all that stuff right there, including adult cash sales. And this gotcha. is all our, our uh, catering revenue for the 28, sorry, 1920 school year. And this would be within the agreement, this is what the, uh, what the return is. And what I mean return is what the leftover would be from all the stuff recorded in the agreement right there. Okay. And remind me of the, because we get, uh, we get some of that, correct? That is correct. That's all and, that goes and, into the, that's, that's correct. And I'll show that to me one more time. Uh, this one right here, the 198,000. That's it. Okay. And so uh, there's a, I know in this time of COVID and everything else, uh, I think Mr. Wallen was sharing that we got some kind of agreement where it's going to benefit both of us pretty well. Is that, is that, did I hear that right, Larry? Oh, what? Larry. I'm sorry. I forgot. <laughs> I was supposed to pull my, no, that's my gown. Right. Yes. Yeah. You're correct. Um, yeah. That's that, in the agreement. And yeah, that was, so that was from where? That was just between us and Chartwell, or correct? That's, that's in our contract with Chartwells. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. 
So very, very the guaranteed amount oh, for yeah. our first year right here, and this is off the agreement, is 235000 Right. But Within, you have to balance that. I'm sorry. You have to balance that against the COVID-19 shutdown from March to May and the changes in operation and all that. So that's why it didn't come out as high as the guaranteed amount should have. Exactly. And the big thing right here is uh, it's a $40,000 revenue deficit. So what we did is uh, we put together a, uh, did a, took what the average number, daily numbers of meals were, and we had 41 days we missed. So we had that 41 days worth of meals, uh, how much the total would have been. And we balanced that against the meals that we sold. That's the term I like to use with COVID-19. We were able to pivot very quickly. And what I mean by that is we had a lot of a product already in house getting ready to come back from spring breaks. So we were able to use that, reduce our food cost. I was able to reduce our staff because as a food service management company, I have that uh, ability to reduce our staff and we were able to move forward with a uh, uh, summer food program, the emergency feeding program. Right. Now with that, we did about only about 35 to maybe 40% of the normal meals we would have uh, done in the regular season. And that reduction is a $40,000 reduction, which is the biggest thing that plays into this right over here. Sure, sure. So gotcha. and according to the agreement, because it's one of, those, one of those things, we didn't have like the full 180 days, but even though we were able to you know, maneuver, that lack of students did not allow us to reach the goal. Right. If that makes sense. I sure. apologize. No, uh, yeah, I understand. Okay. Well, I, I will tell you, you guys have been doing a tremendous job. And, 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 and like you said, I love the word pivot because you guys have had to pivot to where you're dizzy. Yeah. So, it's uh, the entire district. I mean, and so far just yeah. since I've been here and I've been a, uh, my first full year with the school district, like everybody has been so helpful from uh, Vindy and Millie and the superintendents and this entire school has been really great and helpful and just the way everybody picked up and threw in their hat to help out food service when, um, with deliveries and whatnot last yep. year, it was just yep. amazing. Yeah. Staff just was, your staff was phenomenal. Ours was phenomenal. Yeah. It was yep. really good to see the synergy. Yeah. For and sure. This year, this year is going. It started rough, but we are increasing meals. We're uh, doing uh, just about a thousand meals a day, and every day that number goes up. We started offering weekend meals, and that is so far been a huge success. And Good. the bus drivers go out every day and drop off. They do about half our uh, our drop off. So there's about mm. four, 50, 500 meals they get sent off on the buses and whatnot. And right. every day that number is going up. So that proves to me that every day word is getting out and we're trying our, our best to put that word of mouth out. Right, right, right. Uh, board members, you have anything for Mr. Marquez? I don't hear anything. Art, you did great. Not Thank that's you, not sir. bad for your first one. You need to get with Mr. Polizzi. He'll jazz you up a little bit. Oh no, he's great. I love that. <laughs> I was enthralled. <laughs> no, that that was that was good. Appreciate it. And uh, when you do well, we do well. Yes, sir. And Thank so you. We want to make sure that happens. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, now let's go to item C. Uh, that's uh, PUSD Sports, uh, Mr. Wallen, and also Mr. Rivers. Uh, Mr. Rivers, you here? I am, sir. Okay, you want to go ahead? Thank you. Good evening, Governor Board, President Candelaria, Executive Board members, Superintendent Waller, Dr. Maurer, Mr. Rodriguez, and guests. Appreciate the opportunity to meet with you tonight to talk a little bit about our athletics activities and our extracurriculars. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to present a plan that was developed amongst 17 schools in the northeastern part of the state. Uh, including the, most of the schools on the Navajo Nation uh, in El Tuse, and then also uh, Hopi as well. 
And so the main authors of this document were Ryan Dotson from Window Rock. He is a 3A North president. Tayar Yazi from Valley Sanders. He is the 2A North president. Carl Adams from St. Michael's. He's a 1A North president. Ricky Greer, who's from Hopi. He's an executive board member for the Arizona Interscholastic Association and myself. All right, give me one minute to share my screen. So the document that I'm going to present to you is the document that was recently presented to AIA. In fact, yesterday it was presented to the AIA Executive Board. And this plan is the Northeastern Arizona Regional Region Athletic Proposal. And it was a collaboration between 17 schools. This plan would cover January through June of 2021. So as a group of schools, we developed a mission and a vision statement. And our mission was to strive to create safe and healthy educational based athletics and activity opportunities for all of our students. And our vision was to instill the core values in our students that develop responsible adults leading to stronger communities. Uh, we felt like it was very important to identify the reason why we were trying to uh, gather this collaboration. So these are the schools that are involved. Uh, as I mentioned, all of them are in the Navajo Nation, El Chase, Hopi, and then we are the only school that is a uh, not located on uh, the reservation. So the way that it's divided into team sports will be divided into two divisions, a small schools division and a big school division. If you have questions as I'm going through, please don't hesitate to stop me. I'm gonna move through this pretty methodical understanding that you have a copy of the plan. The individual sports will be a one division. Uh, individual sports typically attract wrestling um, and then also uh, cross country would be our considered our individual sports. And then football would divided, be divided into two divisions. The reason there are not 17 schools up there is because there are some schools that do not participate in football and those are typically some of the smaller schools uh, that do not participate. So these would be, be the divisions of the schools. So the proposed season uh, for winter it would be January 4th to March 6th for basketball. I won't go through all the particulars, but some of the things that I will point out is throughout this entire plan, uh, we've uh, collaborated together and decided that it was very important to consider the academics of our students and the fact that they're out of school, uh, they're doing remote learning, some are struggling, some aren't even able to access the internet on a consistent basis. So returning to school, there'll obviously be a period of time where they need to acclimate. And so in developing this plan, we took into consideration that we'll need to keep them in school as much as possible and to miss as little education as possible. And so we've chosen to do the varsity games throughout the week in the evenings, limiting how many, um, teams would miss during the week and then our JV games would typically play on a Saturday or a Friday afternoon. We also took into consideration the safety, uh, understanding that we don't want to put 50 kids on a bus. We want to limit the number of buses. We also understand that we, at least in our school district, and I'm sure we're not the only one, are short on drivers and also other resources as well. And so uh, for all of the Individual sports and the team sports, we've laid them out very similar. The team sports will all have a playoff towards the end that will have a play in game if needed, if there are more than eight teams, and then a round of eight semifinals and championships. The only exception to that rule would be football. Uh, football would just be a regular season. So, January 4th, we took into consideration that would be our first day back. Typically, there's only about two and a half weeks of workouts before games begin, except for football. And so we also took into consideration and put a four week period in there. And I'll show you a calendar at the end so that our students could come back and acclimate uh, to the exercises because we have to treat all of our students as if they're recovering from some significant injury. Uh, the medical advisory committee for AIA, that was one of the recommendations that they gave when returning back to sports, uh, because I am sure that there are a lot of student athletes 
and students in general that have not done a whole lot since March 13th, that Friday the 13th. So the next one would be wrestling. And we put this in there as if we will be able to do it. We understand that this is going to be a significant challenge based upon our current status and our current COVID crisis. Uh, but we still felt like it was important for it to be in here. Uh, the competitions would be on Saturdays. Uh, again, this would be the one area. There's 16 man brackets for the wrestling championship. But we also have a contingency plan that if we're unable to do this in January, we'll push it back to um, middle of April through June for those championships. And again, football, we covered that a little bit. Uh, the idea for football is there'll be six weeks of play or seven weeks of play, excuse me, with six games with no postseason. It would be the winner of the regular season that would win that championship. Volleyball would be very similar to basketball beginning February 22nd, moving to April 17th. Games would be played typically on Tuesday, Thursdays with the JV and freshman competitions taking place on Saturday. And then the, uh, mo I forgot to mention that in most of these scenarios in the playoffs, the high seed would host. Uh, the plan is not to have any overnight trips. The plan is, is to limit the distance of our trips. If it's a four plus hour trip, possibly meeting in the middle somewhere at a, a, a neutral site so that we can limit how much our students are on a bus, also limit how much students are traveling and also how much risk they are at. Cross country, February 22nd to April 17th. We went away from calling them fall sports because obviously they're out in the fall. So we've dubbed them spring football, spring cross country, spring volleyball. Um, and then our track and field would take place April 12th to May 29th. Uh, the championship being on May 29th at a site to be determined. Top 16 qualify for each event. And then Spirit Line also would have the opportunity to do competitions. We got three significant dates uh, dedicated, uh, typically line up with the championships. That will be also defined a little bit more in detail once we know how many teams uh, will be involved. And then baseball and softball, this is the one area in which we extend a little bit further. Uh, the championship for this would be on June 5th. Again, it would be a play-in game if necessary around of eight semifinals and finals. Uh, I'll have to review the board policies and procedures currently to look at what our seniors eligibility are. We've already spoken to AIA. They don't have any concerns with our students continuing to play because the bylaws read they're eligible until the end of the season, which means the last day for the tournament. If our season goes to June 5th, that would be the end of the our season, they would be eligible according to AIA bylaws. I will need to do a little bit of research up to this point. I've not found anything in our policies or procedures that would prohibit uh, our seniors being able to participate in the postseason. And then the rest of this is a calendar in which you can uh, have a visual. I'm very visual. I know a lot of people are. So it just breaks it down in regards to when practice begins, the first competition, and then it's laid out a little bit more concretely uh, in a calendar format versus a written format. And, and I want to emphasize that this is a plan. I know that we have quite a few people that are concerned where we are currently with our COVID crisis. This is a plan, it's an opportunity for our students to have the ability to be able to practice and then compete as long as we're able to do that in a safe and a healthy manner. Uh, if we can't do that in a safe and healthy manner, we'll have another discussion sometime down the road. Um, do you have any questions in regards to the Northeastern plan as I shared it at this point? I, I do have a question. Uh, yes, sir. It, I know it's a, a little bit away, but when you start in January, and you consider trips, and then when you're in other people's locker rooms, and or or maybe you're going to choose to meet outside instead of the locker rooms. I don't know what you guys have talked about, but will there be a, a kind of a consistent protocol in terms of uh, how you sanitize and various things if we're still in the middle of these kind of things, which we probably, I mean, we probably won't be out of the woods yet. So currently, there's two documents that have been provided by AIA and the Sports Medical Advisory Committee. 
And so in those documents, it actually outlines the protocols for that. And in talking to a lot of my peers throughout the state, some that are currently um, starting competitions this weekend, some that are not starting competitions, but most of the plans are one of two things. One, there will be no access to any facilities by the visiting team on a football field. They're going to get porta potties for the other teams to be able to utilize rather than going in buildings. The other one is a limited access uh, and that is based upon uh, the school's determination, five to 10 players being able to access at a time, having a, a what they're terming a COVID coach, being able to monitor how many students will access. Currently in the plan that I, I wrote up about a month and a half ago, there is no access to our locker rooms. And so we would provide whatever facilities they need to be able to use during competition uh, but we would not provide a locker room for you for use. And, and at this point in our first couple of phases coming back for our own student athletes, we would not even utilize locker rooms for our own student athletes until we get to phase three. Okay. Uh, the other thing I was, I was wondering, have you addressed anything about fans in the stands or is that going to be a no, 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 that is also taken into consideration and we're going to, We've had those conversations with the AIA and AIA has put that back on the schools. There are okay. some schools that are having zero fans in attendance. Other, uh, the recommendations from NFHS and across the country right now is about 25% of your fans being able to access. Right. Uh, some schools are allowing two individuals per player. They provide them a card and they must present that when they're at the gate. Uh, other areas are allowing a few more based upon what their um, seating capacity is. So currently our seating capacity in the gymnasium, for example, is 2,800. Uh, if we have a volleyball game, it cuts that in half to about 1,400. If we did 25% of that, uh, we're not looking at a large crowd, um, but that's something that we will take into consideration each school. We'll take that into consideration. Other schools are saying we'll allow our home fans at a certain percentage, but we will not allow visiting fans. Gotcha. Uh, our thought process behind that is, is we want to do everything to contain what's going on in with our community. And we can't do that when we have people coming in to visit our, our facilities. Gotcha. Okay. Any other questions? I, I have a question. Go, go ahead. Go ahead, Sol. Oh, thank you. Um, I was just wondering what the parents' response to this plan has been. So there's been varied response. There's a lot of response that are very positive and encouraging. In fact, some of them want us to get out and start competing today. There have been responses of, nope, not sending my kid back regardless. We're going to sit out at least till January, maybe even longer. And so there's been varying responses in between. Uh, and that's not just within PAGE, that's throughout the, basically the Navajo Reservation and El Chisay and Hopi. Uh, as athletic directors, we met for almost two and a half weeks straight, two to four hours a day developing this plan, sharing information. There's another um, document that you were privy to. It's a memorandum that we sent out as a memo, uh, a brief to the media. And that was where we gathered most of our information from through media posts or other things like that. So some, I wouldn't say any was real negative. I think a lot of it was very cautious. A lot of it was very much, you know what, we're too early to plan. But again, this is a plan for a plan. We're not saying this is going to happen. We're going to say we're going to evaluate things as we go, make decisions based on the data and the current information that we have, instead of just making assumptions moving forward. Uh, it turns out that, uh, you know, we've made some solid decisions. I know that on Friday, the Department of Health in Coconino County met with Flagstaff and Coconino High School, and they told them that they could not um, compete in uh, competitive sports until further notice. And then Northland Prep also is in that as well. And so they are currently not allowed to compete until further notice. And, I'm, and it's partly because of the metrics and the number of cases that were above 100,000 or per 100,000. And that's the reason they've been asked not to. 
Uh, currently, Tucson Unified School District is not participating. Their superintendents will meet this week. They've not even scheduled games. Their superintendents will meet this week and they will make the decision on whether or not they will move forward, start practices and competitions as well within the Tucson Unified School District. Phoenix Unified School District will only compete within football with inside of their, un their Unified School District. They will not compete in postseason play this year. They will only have a city championship to limit transportation. So we're not unique in regards to a modification uh, for athletics or activities. We're unique in the fact that we have decided to look at January 4th as a starting date versus some of the other ones. Let's, let's see what happens as we go. Some of them saying, okay, we've started. Now we have to pump the brakes and we have to stop for a while. And then other ones saying, we're gonna only do it regionally. Thank you. Anybody so, else, Des Desiree, did you have something? Yeah, I have a question. Well, you did answer my question, talk, speaking about Flagstaff Unified, because I did have a conversation with one of the board members about what they were, their plans were as far as continuing with practices and so forth, but that wasn't approved through the school board. But it was a pretty good conversation. And the other thing that I wanted to ask you was, um, you know, majority of our students compete and an example, you know, some of our athletes do utilize this athletes um, or, you know, academically to their advantage as using it for scholarships and so forth for college. How does that interfere with um, how the changes are going to be? Because I know, um, I, I, I'm pretty sure we've all received our letter today, um, specifically, you know, AIA is my understanding. I know that this is a little bit different, but the state champ, um, the state competitions are still happening. Um, can you just clarify that for me? So some of the state championships are happening currently in volleyball. There are 25% of the schools throughout the state that will not participate throughout all levels of volleyball competition. In football, it will also happen as well. But you've got 17 schools in the north, you've got 20 in the south, and you have Phoenix Unified School District that will not participate in that state championship. So yes, it will be called a state championship, but no, it will not include the entire AIA body. In regards to scholarships for our athletes and those opportunities, I actually had the opportunity to talk to a scout and a coach down in the Phoenix area that called to get information about some of our football players, shared the plan about the opportunity to play in the spring. They're very excited. Uh, they don't have really a whole lot except for spring football. And so they will be easily able to scout our games and to also look at our student athletes. The primary driving force behind this was to provide an opportunity for all of our student athletes. We could have said, you know what, we're just gonna worry about the, the winter and the spring, give them an opportunity. But we also felt like, you know, if we're able to, let's try to get fall in there as well. Um, if there's no more, if, is there any more questions regarding this specific plan? Because I'd like to touch base on some of our other extracurriculars real quick. And then also, um, this plan, unfortunately, does not affect our golf team, our boys and girls soccer team, and then also our boys and girls tennis teams. And so we had to come up with a contingency plan for them. Our boys and girls soccer team and our golf team currently compete in the fall. They have lost their season according uh, and at this point, it's too late to schedule, even if we came back October 12th, because the state championships are the last part of October, the first part of November. So I recently sent an appeal and I copied in President Candelaria, I believe, and, and Mr. Wallen and Ms. Martin, our principal. And I appealed for our students to have the opportunity to still be able to compete. Uh, we were able to win that appeal. So our golf team will be able to compete co-ed in the spring. And that'll start probably the second week in February and go to the end of April, middle of April. And then our boys and girls soccer programs have been granted one year exemption to be able to go back to the winter schedule, which I fought pretty hard to get out of, but they have readily accepted us back into the winter program so that they'll have the opportunity to compete. If conditions permit, we can start practicing November 9th. 
Competitions could start as early as November 30th, but AIA also understands that we may not be able to compete until January uh, and they're willing to accommodate us in that regards. Tennis, we didn't have to do anything about because tennis uh, is in the spring. So we're fortunate in that regard. So they would follow the typical timeline starting the second week in February and they would go till middle to late April, uh, the first part of May. I do have a, a question about that because I, as, I, as I recall, uh, your letter, your petition letter um, uh, suggested that we, we'd be part of the Northwest that uh, is com correct. conference. And, and so and we talked about travel and overnights. How is that going to impact that? And then tennis, uh, normally they're, they're traveling down the valley for their competition. They are. And, and we may have to look at those individually and possibly make some exceptions. But in talking to a lot of the athletic directors, they're willing to accommodate earlier times so that our students won't return home so late. Good, good. Yeah, that's good. So they've been, we've been fortunate in developing some great relationships with some of those athletic directors and also the coaches. They've been very accommodating. Uh, for tennis, we're fortunate that we actually are able to play some schools up in Flagstaff. And then um, the rest, unfortunately, are in Kingman and Phoenix, just right. because that's where those schools are located. Right. And then any I, other? Oops, so go, go ahead. ahead no, sir. no, I was just going to ask if there are any comments or questions. All right, I'd be remiss if I didn't speak on to a few more of our activities and then also some of our extracurriculars. Uh, and speaking, I actually have met with quite a few coaches recently, uh, and not all of them, but I, I've met with a lot of them, and. Speech and debate, the, the newest update for speech and debate is they're probably going virtual and they'll have competitions on Friday, but they'll be able to submit uh, their speeches uh, video and they'll be able to still be able to continue to compete. I'm not, we're still trying to find out some detailed information because they've had some change in leadership. They've changed their website. So Ms. Valentina, she is uh, wonderful and doing an incredible job. She's currently meeting with her students online uh, and she's actually picked up a couple additional students this year, so that program's growing. Chess had already been moved to the spring by AIA. We currently are slated to host the individual chess championships, and I've touched base with Norm Cambridge, who's our new chess coach for that, so we're pretty excited about the opportunity and only our second year since Yuma was hosted at last year, so it'll be nice to host that this year. Color Guard will possibly also be able to compete remotely. We're still trying to get some more information about Color Guard uh, and speaking to the coach. Uh, that was the last update and that was a couple of weeks ago. And the same with marching band and WGI. We're still waiting. Marching band season probably will not happen at this point. Um, WGI may happen. It could be remote. They're still at this point trying to develop what that's going to look like and they've taken into consideration. I know that. Uh, Mr. Johnson shared with me they may be able to compete uh, via video or remotely. And then the additional extracurricular activities will be reevaluated re on return in person, such as drama. I currently have had conversations in that regards. Uh, our clubs about meeting back in person currently, they're all meeting uh, via Google Meets for the most part. And then other uh, extracurriculars that will. Um, could possibly fall into that area as well. Do you have any other questions? I hope I didn't leave anybody out. If so, I'm sure I'll get a text soon. <laughs> no doubt. Uh, board members, are we okay? Uh, Ernie, I'll just say one thing. That, man, uh, you guys have done a great job in, in, in circumventing our circumstances and those kind of things. And, and I know the, the, the students and the school's really appreciative of that because that takes a whole lot of whole lot of work to pull all those things together. And then I really am excited you you uh, told us about chess and you told us about the rest of the extracurriculars. That's great. So thanks a lot for all that work. And I got to tell you, hands down, uh, your quarantine has led to the best beard during COVID-19 at Page Unified School District. <laughs> well, I don't know. There, there's a gentleman down at uh, the middle school. Oh, okay. Uh, he's, uh, I think, our second or third year teacher, and I want to believe he's from Virginia, who has an amazing beard. Yeah. Uh, so 
I, uh, I don't want to take that. And this is a COVID beard. He had his prior. I know, I know. Yeah, I know. I hear you. Looking good, though, Rivers. Thank you. Old, okay. old, but old, but good. You know, five daughters sometimes will make you age a little bit. <laughs> really so. Can't even. I can't even imagine. They're amazing right. women, but I appreciate <laughs> your time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Rivers. Appreciate all the work. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, next up. Audit. I, I don't like this. Stuff. I'm going to leave while you talk about all those audit stuff. I've in my life, I've gone through too many audits. Uh, item D presentation, audit findings, non-compliance USFR. That's Vindy. You got the great task of letting us know the good news. Mr. President, members of the board, Superintendent Wallen, today we will um, look at what our 90 day corrective action process will look like. So let me share my screen with you. So here, um, I want to let you know that the Arizona Auditor General's Office issued us with the 90 day letter due to significant deficiencies that they noted in our um, internal controls for the past few years. So in uh, these deficiencies were noted in the district audit uh, report and the USFR compliance questionnaire. So here you see this shows you the timeline they provided and the, this report is due to the Auditor General's office on November 13th. So this corrective action process has three stages. First is the education process, then implementation and evaluation. In the education process, uh, each department has time to research what the deficiencies were and list down the specific steps in the process, uh, list documentation needed in, e in the each step, and uh, also they need to uh, mention who is responsible for each step of the uh, corrective process. Also, we are required to state when the corrective pro process would we was implemented and um, to, implemented to correct the deficiencies. As part of the evaluation of the corrective action, uh, Mr. Wallen is selected as an in, as the independent internal person who's not involved in these processes to uh, conduct the evaluation process uh, of each section and then we certify that the correct in, uh, corrective action was um, implemented uh, in the next uh, tabs you'll see what each of the sections were here in the accounting record uh, process we were cited for we were um, our deficiency was uh, coding issues like I've shared this with you, um, I think in April when this report first came out. And in the budgeting section, it was the timelines of uploading the budget and um, also the timeline of um, when the notification of the um, adaptive budget uh, was uploaded. And then in the cash and revenue section, we had a few things, again, um, it was, um, timeline issues where we, uh, for example, we missed um, not stamping a deposit we received. So maybe it's a couple of the 10 they reviewed, but uh, it was cited as a deficiency. And uh, the in the uh, next section, the agreement, there was agreement they thought, they, cite, they said that we did not have a um, fully executed copy of the agreement. Since then, we have corrected all of these um, deficiencies. So we have to now share um, what we have done with the Auditor General's Office. And with in, uh, information technology, we had, um, for example, we had to test our disaster recovery plan and it, it was not tested on a timely manner is the deficiency. In payroll, there were, um, it was cited that uh, out of the selection they said uh, did uh, two of the employees we did not have uh, i9s on file was a, a finding and if you go into uh, the procurement and credit cards um, the main uh, finding there was that we did not have signed credit card user agreements for all of our uh, users so and under property property control um, 
for example, the one was if the capital asset uh, addition list did not agree with the capital outlay reconciliation. So since then we've cre corrected all of this. This was also, you have to remember, this was fiscal year 1819 uh, that these um, deficiencies were um, found. And under the student activity funds, um, we have our, um, actually these deficiencies, we are researching these and we are in discussion with the AG's office to see if we could appeal um, these two deficiencies that they, they were not um, uh, findings. So um, in the student attendance report, um, these are the findings and we've uh, in, your, in the packet we printed for you, you will see all of that. Um, for example, I can cite, um, pick one where this is where uh, they reviewed four of 10 entry, uh, four out of the 10 entries reviewed, the district did not maintain sufficient variable, verifiable documentation of Arizona residency was the finding. And transportation support, uh, the deficiency was that um, we did not, um, the first, we did not um, use the AM, uh, and PM average for when we calculated our um, student eligible um, eligible students based on the first 100 days. So um, in each of the tabs, you'll see that we've kind of specifically stated all of the steps that we follow for these deficiencies and then the documentations we will be looking at and um, the person who's responsible for each step and uh, the date of implementation. Evaluation it will come up here um, in the next few weeks and we will share with you what our results are when uh, we do that internally and what we hear back from the Auditor General's office. We have 90 days to correct and submit this plan to them. If you have any questions for me, sir, that will be the end. I have a question. Go. Can I go ahead? Yes, yes, go. Oh, thank you. Okay, you said that was for school year 1819. Um, yes. Remind me when you came on board? I came Which on board. Year was? It was March of 2019 is when I came on board. Towards the end of- So who was in charge of all this when we had all these findings? Uh, Mr. Kevin Dickerson. But didn't we have an interim business manager? So that was our consultant. He was mainly tasked by the superintendent to work on budget and uh, related um, a, the annual financial report, the budget, and um, actually the numbers, if I may say. So, but there's a lot more that ties to an audit. It's your transport, what your transportation department does and um, it, your, um, say for example, your student attendance, what goes on there and your um, bookstore, those, there are a lot of things that was, were overseas, so that was part of the superintendent's plan to him taking over some of those pieces to oversee. And um, um, Mr. Maurer was also part of the uh, process uh, in that year. So it, it, the lack of us not having that position filled was the part of the problem. Okay, because I thought we, Dr. Maurer, can you answer that question? I yes. thought you. I thought we paid you a twenty thousand dollar stipend to take care of all that. So the the original conversation that we had was to keep all of the parts moving, um, not necessarily all of this. So when we look back through this audit, um, you're looking at things like the attendance. The attendance isn't in the privy in this instance of the business office when it comes to um, the way it's calculated and all the moving parts, transportation, 
Um, my role was purchasing, receiving, uh, payroll, uh, keeping the HR processes running forward. So a lot of these are, and I don't want to minimize it because it's not minimal, but they are correctable and they are pieces that when you don't have a dedicated person doing that position, doing in and day out, that some of the things that will, they will be missed. Okay, I'm just gonna flat come out with it and not beat around the bush, but um, this is the worst audit, audit finding that I have seen in, in 12 years. Um, usually we have two or three findings and they're usually very small and this, this is just terrible. And I thought that we put you in charge um, and paid you $20,000 extra to make sure that, you know, this was all running smoothly. Yeah, so That's I would the impression to... I had back then that we, I remember approving that stipend and I'm just um, wondering what happened there. Yeah, and I, I would have to go back and look and see exactly what the stipend amount was. I do not remember it being at that level. Um, but oh, it was humongous. It was huge. I remember that because I was not happy with it. And I was told back then that th that was going to make up for the lack of having, um, for the lack of a business manager that between you and the consultant, um, it was going to be covered. I, I don't, ma'am, I do not have an answer for that. Let, let, let me okay, step well, in. Just... I would. I but would I, like I to see it. some more specific answers because yeah. I'm, you know, this is, this is, this is, um, this is really quite something. Let, let me step in just for a second. Cause I, I, um, I jumped in this early, just early when I realized that there were some issues and, uh, I, I do remember that Dr. Maurer was put in a position, although he wasn't where he was having to correct several things in the finances himself because there was a process of discovery going on that led of course to, to mr dickerson being uh, put on leave um, and then ultimately let go and uh, at that point there was uh, many many concerns uh, in terms of uh, where is this money has it been done has it been put properly and and it and, and i and i don't know the specifics between Superintendent Varner and Dr. Maurer, but they both had to share something that really wasn't their wheelhouse. And so they were scrambling just to make sure that, and I'll just say it straight out too, that there wasn't any embezzlement. Uh, funds were still there. That's what Dean came, uh, is it, was his name Dean? Gene, yes, it was Gene. There was, there was $1.7 million. Right, right. And so I know. Checks. Yes, sir. Well, and, and I know Terry was in a whole nother area and, and what brought me to it because I saw him dealing with finance. I said, hey, what's going on here? And that's kind of when we had a uh, uh, face-to-face meeting with, you know, something seriously wrong. And so uh, anyway, I, and, I, and, and I know with these kind of findings, uh, they are, this is overwhelmingly more uh, than we've had before. And I don't disagree with you, Sandra, 100% agree. The only thing I'd want to see, uh, instead of just saying we did this, all of these beg one thing. Uh, a lot of them are transparency and accountability issues in our process. So when we say it's been fixed, uh, that's not going to be good enough. Uh, what has to happen is here's the, and I'm getting a big echo and I don't know why. Who is, who's still on or something? Ed, are you, are yes. you, you're muted? No. I'm could, could you mute real quick? Oh, there you go. Thank you. I think that was it. I'm sorry. Uh, but, but in this, the most important thing we can do right now, uh, Bindi, you inherited something. Uh, and so, uh, but now the responsibility to, to establish the process that will tell us that these things aren't going to happen again. That's what, that's the most important thing I want to hear to say it's, it's fixed. Uh, is not good enough. We have to say, here's the process to ensure this is not going to reoccur. So, because that's a, those are the things that are really important. Uh, once we find some, because some of these things are very alarming. When you start dealing with, we can't reconcile the cash that came in and all all of those kind of things. Uh, that's yeah, that's not good. So, 
again, you've inherited something, uh, but when we see the fix, uh, November 13th, you're supposed to have a plan in, but then when it's resolved, then when you and your group need to say, okay, here's the steps and the processes that we are assured will not allow us to, to violate that. And again, it's a, it's a process and it's, uh, it has to do management of change so that people take up that slack and where we can say there's transparency and accountability and every, in every way that we handle money. So that's, that's my, my summary, I guess, from, from my point of view. Hey, Rob, that was kind of the point I wanted to make also out there. And I think this happened, well, I think a little bit over a year ago. So I would think we should have had a plan in already by now to where on a quarterly basis, something we should have been double checking. So I would think we will have something in place way before this point. Yes, sir. After uh, the first audit, uh, after I took this position, we had the audit in June of 2019. Yes, uh, right after we found out uh, the the deficiencies, we did make um, plans and procedures. We have them in place to um, go through um, these steps and, and implement. So, but at this point, we have to after with the 90 days we've gotten, <clears throat> we will be reporting this to the Arthur General's office. Um, it's the next step, yes. If that answers your question, sorry. Yes, yes, I did. Thank you. Anybody else have anything, uh, Sandra? I, 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 or you don't feel like you've been cut off? Have you said everything you need to? Are you good? Okay. All right. I know uh, these are, t these are always tough to, to take. And uh, I will guarantee you the one that sees it first, that's always the toughest for me uh, because uh, now, uh, you know, Vinda, you're on, you're on the button and uh, I know you had a lot thrown at you, but um, yeah, when we, when we come back with it, let's, let's just see the process that says, this is how we put this, this is what we put in place so that it does not happen. So does that, does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay, appreciate that very much. Anybody else have anything? All right, let's go ahead and go on to our next uh, item, item E. That's a PUSD employee turnover presentation, Dr. Maurer. President Candelaria, members of the Governing Board, Superintendency, uh, good evening. I'm sorry for the lighting. I'm trying to correct that. Uh, I, I'm doing the best I can. Um, let me share my screen here with you. Uh, we're looking at the turnover. Uh, all right. So what we're looking at is the certified staff turnover. I do want to um, start by saying there has been a request uh, to look at full turnover, also classified members as well. Um, I think that is definitely something we can look at, uh, bring together for a little bit later on. This is just the certified. So when we think about the certified staff, we're thinking about uh, occupational therapists, school psychologists, teachers, uh, administration, so the entire certified group. Uh, I did leave all of the historical data in from when I can find back. Uh, so you would have had Gwen Laszlo as a previous human resources director. Uh, she would have produced some of this information, even people prior to her. Uh, and then I did come in, like we know, uh, November of 2017. Uh, one of the things that was very evident and was uh, talked about when I very first got here was the transition between the previous superintendent, the staff turnover, and how do we go about mitigating that process? Uh, we saw uh, surveys going out. A lot of it came around things like housing. Uh, how were we recruiting? Who were we recruiting? Uh, so working over the last couple of years, um, you can see the turnover. And I'm looking specifically here uh, in these areas here. So this is the total staff that separated. So in this case, we're looking 
at 1516. Uh, that trend has held well. Uh, last, the previous year, uh, we had 25. And this last year, uh, we had 29 staff turnover. Uh, when we look at this also, I want us to remember that the governor stepped in and did his 20 by 20 promise. Uh, so when we look at this, we were thinking about the governor was going to uh, provide additional funding up to 20% for certified staff, teachers raises. Um, and so we did know right away uh, because we talked to the staff that they were, a 10% raise was substantial and you as the governing board authorized that. Uh, so we moved uh, from the, this year to here and then to the next year because it was 10 year or 10%, 5%, 5%. Um, we see our retirements have held pretty steady. Um, those are individuals who have reached the, their, their end of their careers uh, and, and have decided to separate through retirement. Uh, and then our um, non-renewals. So these would be individuals trying to work with them, um, but things just are not mutually agreeable. We can see we had one of those in this previous year. Uh, one thing I do wanna call out, cause it will be a question. Uh, we noticed the trend was trending down as our, our student enrollment has trended down. We see the certified staff had trended down. In this case, we see an uptick last year in the 1920. Uh, this, is, this is directly attributed to additional uh, resources allocated to Lakeview additional resources allocated to Page Middle School. And then we had two individuals who moved from classified to certified. So uh, those are in the system um, as certified staff. So they are accounted for in that way. Uh, one of the things we look at is uh, when they separate with PUSD, uh, how long had they been with us, right? So how long are we, allow, are, are we retaining our employees? Um, this trend here where we see zero to five is not uh, a new trend for PUSD nor for the teaching profession itself. Uh, getting teachers to and into the profession and maintaining them for years, uh, especially in a single district is very difficult. Uh, so we see that this stays about the same over the years. Uh, and then we see our employees at the other end who have been with us for quite some time as they retire out of our system. Uh, actually in the profession, this is one of the ones that uh, when we go out and we recruit, uh, we're looking to recruit across the board, right? We want new teachers, veteran teachers, uh, so in this case, we see that with, the, with this small little nuance here, uh, most of the teachers leaving PUSD have about the same amount we're losing across all avenues. So 20 plus years in the profession, six of them left uh, PUSD. Uh, seven years, eight years, seven years. So we see that that holds pretty steady for us uh, there's not one demographic or one group that's leaving PUSD uh, in years of the profession. Uh, the last piece is, so what are we, what are we doing uh, to, to mitigate some of this loss? Uh, because we do know that uh, to recruit is expensive, to train is expensive, uh, and to lose employees uh, is expensive. Uh, so one of the things that we've heard is the amount of paperwork, the amount of stuff that people have to do uh, in order to be hired and then in order to be maintained in our district, uh, that we should automate more of those processes. And we're seeing that happening over the past couple of years. Uh, instead of having to use DVDs to watch videos, they now can watch them online and it captures everything. Uh, instead of the paperwork that people have to sign every year, they're able to do that online. So that's, that is something that we're working on. Uh, new for this year is our virtual recruiting trip. Uh, we have now partnerships with a, a company or a, 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 it's, a, it's called Handshake. It's a platform uh, and it allows us access to over 200 colleges. Uh, so now instead of us going down to ASU, we can, we can be virtually in 200 colleges posting our job recruit across the United States and, and abroad. Uh, we're going, we, we've continued uh, our cooperation with our in-state schools. So 
any individual who has a bachelor's degree and is in the is a teacher or works for us uh, has access to a free master's degree in AU, ASU, and U of A. Uh, and then anyone who is one of our paraprofessionals or an employee who doesn't have a bachelor's degree yet, hasn't completed it, and wants to become a teacher, we can also work to get them a free bachelor's degree as well. Uh, so we are currently uh, working with multiple teachers on both of those avenues. The last is uh, our Grow Your Own. Uh, that started a couple of years ago. We're continuing that. And if you look back to the old slides, you would see we had currently four people in it as well. That's because we've actually taken one of our employees who's grown inside of our system, became a teacher, and we have another one that's dropped into that. So we still have four, uh, but I'm, I'm happy to say that we have put additional staff members uh, growing through our ranks into our teaching. Any, any questions? Yes, I have a question. Okay, so I don't know if it's just my slide, but I don't see any actual numbers and percentages. Can you give me those? Like, I can only guesstimate on the total separated and retired and the total number of staff. Do I have a faulty slide? So can you see my screen right now? Yeah, I can see that, but that's not part of what I received. Why did we not receive those numbers? So this, this would have been uploaded to, to your Google Docs. Um, I can see what that one looks like on your guys' side. But this is the same presentation on, on. Yeah, one thing, one thing I would, um, if it's downloaded as a, as a PowerPoint and then your computer converts it, it may lose some information. Um, so I'd have to go back and look and see how it was put on Google Docs, or not on Google Docs, sorry, on the governing board um, agenda. Okay, because I, all I see is a graph. I don't have any actual numbers. I, I know the packet that we got, uh, I believe it's from Lynn, uh, is complete. Maybe she can just send those to you. I, I apologize for that, Mrs. Kidman. I'll, I'll look at see. And that's see. okay. Well, that that's why I'm asking because I can't see what you're showing. Okay. So um, out of the 170, so for this last year, out of the 177 uh, certified staff, we had 29 uh, separate with us. Uh, the year prior, we had 171 and 25. And then the year prior to that was 172 and 34. So we've, we've maintained a, a, a relatively lower number of separating employees, although it's not as low as we'd like to see, it is definitely lower than previous years where it was in the, the 50s and mid 40s. Okay, question then, um, is the 29, so where, where's the actual percentage of turnover? Um, I, so I don't- the 29 plus seven plus one, right? So it would be 20, it would be total. So 177 or 29 divided by 177. So 20, almost 21% turnover last year. Okay. Dr. Mott. Put percentages to that and then resend that back through. Uh, so that way we can see percentages across numbers. Absolutely. Dr. Maurer, with the incentive, I, and I did like that idea, if there are any other type of incentive that you guys are currently uh, thinking about, um, especially when you bring on new uh, uh, teachers and everything, maybe some type of housing incentive for the first year or so or something like that to help retention. Do you have any other ideas out there? So for the initial recruitment, if you are in state, there is a $750 relocation uh, stipend that's, that's given to them. Uh, if it is out of state, that's $1,500 to help offset some of those moving costs and initial setups. Uh, there is not a current, um, there is not a current uh, uh, retention stipend. Uh, we did have those in the past. 
Uh, but those, those are very expensive because it's all staff that you would be working to retain. Uh, so when you're looking at about 350 employees, uh, that, that multiplies very quickly. Uh, one of the things we, you know, we do know, uh, and this has been something that we've been working on, is the, the mentoring program. When we look at teachers specifically, uh, making sure they're connected to a person on their campus, uh, we're checking in with them every month. We're going through professional development with them, uh, moving that into the second and third year. Uh, and then one thing I think that, that we've, we've worked hard is when we go on these recruiting trips, we're taking individuals with us, uh, but we're, we're, we're making sure they understand what PAGE is about and what, where PAGE is prior to just recruiting anyone. Uh, and then they get here and, and we've seen this uh, when we look back, let me go back here. We've seen some of the really, really high turnover. Uh, and so the ability to start bringing that down even further is something that we're gonna continue to work towards. Uh, Boardman, any, any other questions or comments, board? Yeah, I'm concerned about our turnover again. Yep. Um, Anything above 15% is concerning. So I hope, well, it should be interesting. Okay, thank you. Okay, any, uh, yeah. anything further? Yeah, go I ahead. I have a question. Yes. Uh, Dr. Mamari, I think you came after I was brought in to serve on the board. At that time, I had talked a little bit about grooming your own teachers. And I had asked for how many teachers do we have that are being challenged by the state tests that has been challenging for these teachers to pass. What's the status on that? I know that we got some administrators that are in the position to teach and help these teachers are, that are being challenged to pass the state teacher tests. Do you have any idea on how many we might have in the, those in that category and what we can do to help them to pass the tests? Yes, ma'am, that's a, that's a very good question. And that, that, is, um, that is out there, the state tests are one avenue with which a uh, teacher can be certified. Uh, we do have other options now where they can use coursework. So let's say they're taking a certain amount of classes at Northern Arizona University, they pass those courses, that would be equal then to the test. Uh, or they can show competency in the classroom or subject matter uh, where they would do that over the course of a year or two uh, their evaluations would be uh, part of that, and then a letter would be written for them, and then they could get that in lieu of the test as well. So there's a couple of extra avenues that have opened up uh, that we have used uh, this in the previous years to, to alleviate some of that. Uh, and then the majority of the, well, the majority of the in-state programs and out-of-state programs are now aligned to when the student completes the coursework, the certificate is attached to that completion. So the, the tests are now embedded inside of the coursework. So we don't see exactly the, the level of teachers struggling to pass the tests. Uh, and then if we do have one in particular, we definitely work with them. But my office working with the, with the teachers, getting them certified, uh, we look at multiple avenues that would best fit that teacher. Because we are just so in dire need of teachers, especially with the population that we're serving, that was just my concern that I have. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, and I, I would be, um, I would be remiss to tell you uh, that we, uh, or, or I'm actually excited to tell you that uh, we have, uh, and in the past year, so last year and this year, we have 100% of our staff 
certified as teachers. We are working to get them appropriately certified, um, but that is a process in itself. Uh, when I stepped into the Page Unified School District, we had 16 teachers uh, that were not certified or even appropriately certified to be in the positions they were in. So we've made leaps and bounds uh, to get to where we're at today. Uh, and that, that's a lot of hard work on our administrators, hard work on the supports around the teachers. Uh, it's not one person that does it. It's, it's a real team effort and a real focus uh, of our school district. What about our paraprofessional? How many are close to getting their certification? Would you know that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, I, I would like to add that question on to the next presentation, maybe in November or December, uh, because I know we've been working with some of our paraprofessionals uh, on their associate's degrees, which would then move them into possibly a bachelor's in teaching. Uh, so I could definitely get those numbers for you for uh, a, a later presentation when we look at the, the classified staff uh, turnover, but how many of them are moving towards the teaching ranks and where are they currently at. But I do know we have four right now that are, are really close to becoming teachers for us. Good to know, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. McCary. That's, that was, those are good, uh, good points to make. And uh, I, like everybody else, I read about uh, the impact of COVID on our teaching staffs. And that's across the board, uh, and it's it's challenging, especially those that have been in teaching for a while. And so it's going to be interesting what the numbers are uh, after this year, uh, because it's it's been a real challenge for everybody, for sure. Any other comments or or questions from anybody? So, and I, one quick thing, um, I I was going to add that that exact comment that you made uh, to maybe a, a November or December uh, work study. Uh, just to see what the impacts of COVID have been to our teaching ranks and our and our all of our staffing ranks, uh, yep. because it is a, it is an impact. It, we, we have to recognize it. Definitely so. All right, thank you, Dr. Mao. Appreciate it very much. You're welcome. Look forward to your updates. All right, let's move on to item F, uh, and that that's a discussion review of Director of Indian Education job description, uh, Mr. Wallen. Uh, Mr. President, members of the board, I'd uh, like to share with you a proposal for a uh, the job description uh, for the Director of Indian Education, if that's what we want to call it. That's still up in the air if, as I look at this, but basically I've taken the, the responsibilities and expanded them uh, dramatically in a different direction rather than just running the JOM program, the Title VI program. I'm asking if this is the title that we want, and that's it could be coordinator instead of director. And understand the word coordinator and director has to do with salary expectations. So that's something uh, that I will come back with at the next meeting uh, when we make the uh, recommendation. And then the position summary, I wanna revise that position statement. Um, when I go down and evaluate the essential duties and responsibilities, there's some words that are mis missing. And so what I've added is the first one is to provide expertise to infuse culturally responsive education to meet the academic, social, and emotional needs of Native American students. So one of the key criteria in this position is to be able to look at culturally responsive education, is to look at the, the leading the development of Navajo language history government classes, because that also leads to what we call the Chief Manuelito pathway, uh, right. which is a, a scholarship. You know, my son had that scholarship. It's $7,000 a year for uh, about as long as you want to go to school up to your doctorate and uh, we need to be more uh, more students preparing for that I haven't even given a, a KPI a key performance objective to the high school support services team that I would like to see a minimum of 20 uh, chief Manuelito scholarships this year and so they should be in the process of identifying students and can, getting them in that in that uh, pathway for preparing for career and college editing readiness. There's also other, um, you know, uh, scholarships out there, but that's one that that is very unique to um, a large group of our population. And the other the other thing is this is Navajo language history and government. Um, it's interesting that we start Navajo language in sixth grade, 
uh, when we know that language is acquired in preschool and first kindergarten, first and second. And so one of the proposals I'll be working on if we can find the funding is to expand our Navajo language program down to preschool. It would be very appropriate given our student population and especially our student population in preschool to look at a uh, immersion program for, for preschool. So some of those things that this position would work on is to look at those um, development of the language uh, program and then look at new funding sources to support that uh, supervised development, implementation, and monitoring and coordination of specifically two programs, the JOM and the Title VI grants, as outlined by district, tribal, and federal regulations, uh, and look at that as, as how those programs work and bring them out of their silos. That's one of the issues that I've uh, talked to the board about in the beginning is, is breaking the silos. Develop and lead parent involvement projects. Uh, to assist students. And as you heard uh, Ryan talking about, parent involvement is now even more critical than it ever has been with the virtual environment and the providing that uh, classroom, providing that home office, putting those things together for kids. Uh, so becoming an expert in that. Again, culturally responsive education, but also culturally responsive academic enrichment, uh, Native, Native language instruction, culturally responsive counseling and culturally responsive professional development. So those are some of the pieces that I've added um, in there, works with and designated committees to provide information input representing both the beliefs of the district and the Native American community. Uh, so those are some of the pieces, the development of communication plan um, and then working on you know the JOM grant uh, the, uh, with the IEC and then uh, Title VI. And uh, one other point I want to draw your attention to is going over the qualifications um, that this could be potentially a, a administrator, could be a teacher on, on special assignment. But I have uh, added, put the requirements at a minimum bachelor's degree in education or in public administration or related field uh, as one of the, the minimum requirements. So minimally, they must have a bachelor's degree and also that they must be bilingual uh, preferred, but uh, we would like to see that to be required. And then obviously grant writing experience. So these are some of the proposals I put together with the idea of number one, I need to revise the position statement as I've gone through it a little bit more and then uh, look cleaning up a, a few other pieces of language in here. So I'm prepared to ask questions. This is looking at what that would look like. Remember we have, uh, I guess the director of Indian education, we have that, that uh, office, but we also have a, a director of support services, uh, which is another district office that, that deals with students as well and looking at how to meld those together so they work together and providing the needs for our students. So just some of the pieces in there to look at. Once um, the board has approved this in your October meeting, I intend to share this with the Indian education committee uh, if they want to have some input into this, then I would be bringing this back in October for your approval, and then we would start the recruitment process. Questions I can answer for you. Board members? Yeah. One of my concerns is that in, in here and financially, can we really afford to go this route at this time financially also? And will this role not only su support one culture, but all of those minority cultures also? That's a good question. Um, first of all, this is an existing position. This is a result of the retirement of the recent director. So it's not, not a new position and not a new salary. Uh, but yes, that's a good question. Um, and that would then change the role a little bit more. I guess when you're looking at culturally responsive education, um, that would be for all of our minority students. But remember that our Native American students are not a minority, they're majority. Um, and so that kind of turns that around, but we do have Hispanics and we do have some Orient, uh, um, Orientals. Did I say that right? Um, in that respect. So yes, uh, and that may be that I need to, to focus on the concepts of culturally responsive 
and education, uh, but I still want them to work on native language instruction and those pieces as well. Exactly, I, I agree with you. Question, Larry. Yes, ma'am. Um, we have several other border town schools like Holbrook, Winslow, Flagstaff. They also have JOM, right? Correct. So have you looked at their job description as far as what they do in serving their communities? No, I have not, but I can do that and have that. It'd be kind of interesting. In October, I can pull their job descriptions as well as the scope of duties, yes. That would, okay, I can pull that up. Thank you, good point. Uh, well, and, the, and as far as I'm concerned, the best um, JOM person was Evelyn Begay in Ganado, so that's a, one I should probably pull as well. She did the most fantastic job of community involvement and community engagement and was well recognized throughout Navajo Nation for her efforts in that area. I'll okay, get good. That one. Good, good. Any other board members' comments, questions? So good first run, and then uh, you have some good comments by, by our board. So thank you so much. All right, let's go ahead and move on uh, to item G, uh, discussion item, dr uh, bus driver shortage. Mr. Wallen, Dr. Um, Maurer. Dr. Maurer, yeah. Good uh, evening again, Governing Board President, Governing Board members. I, I tried to fix the lighting the best I could. Um, when we talk about uh, seeing the screen here, um, bus drivers help wanted. Uh, we, we, we're looking at, and Mr. Wallen's going to speak to uh, the phased approach to coming back to school uh, with your guys' approval. Uh, we look at how many routes we have, how many current bus drivers we have, uh, what the mitigation strategy for riding the buses would be. Uh, and in the context of all of that, we know we are going to need somewhere between 17 and about 25 bus drivers. Uh, when we currently started this project about two and a half, three weeks ago, uh, we were looking at having about nine bus drivers currently. Uh, and so we've started aggressively recruiting. Uh, and in this context, uh, when we think about where we were at then to where we're at now, uh, we now have 13 bus drivers. We signed another bus driver today. Uh, we have two, possibly three more in the works. Uh, so we are getting there. Uh, it's a slow process to, to build a bus driver from uh, a person who comes off the street, does not have a commercial driver's license, does not have the appropriate endorsements. Uh, you're looking at a 45 to 60 day process. Uh, it can be fast tracked, but you know, you're, you're talking about transporting students. So we'd wanna make sure we're looking at quality there, not just the speed with which we can get credentials in place. Um, so some of the emergency, or not emergency, the immediate fixes, uh, we're looking at what would, it, what would it take to put some substitute bus drivers in? So they would still need the appropriate endorsements. They would still need all the moving parts that our bus drivers need and all bus drivers need, but instead of making them employees, full-time employees with the Page Unified School District, uh, we would look at using them as substitutes, much like we do our current substitute pool for our teachers, uh, for our custodial staff. Uh, and then in that, if they wanna transition into a full-time position or a part-time position, we could definitely uh, start to groom them in. Uh, but we know with much of our substitute pool, when it's the teachers or even uh, any of our other staff, uh, that most of the time it's either a second job or they're a retired individual or they're financially independent and like to give back to the community. Uh, so that substitute pool may not be the best for a long-term fix, but it definitely could help. Um, contract out. So I've, I've made some phone calls with some local agencies uh, on what would it look like to what would it look like and what would costs look like for us to contract for five bus drivers for 10 bus drivers. Uh, I'll have some of those numbers as we move into the next governing board meeting uh, so that you have some specifics around that. And then uh, the last one, the shift in ability, uh, really thinking about current individuals who have CDLs 
but what would it take to, to, to use that CDL that they currently have in the bus driving pool? So that's a much quicker turnaround uh, than just, uh, just building a brand new bus driver from scratch. Um, Long-term fixes, this is what will come back in, in October. Uh, and if you do think back just a year ago, we did adjust this pay structure. It had um, significant impact. We, we were able to bring in five, six, seven additional bus drivers. Uh, but with COVID, we've seen uh, all of our, all of our uh, employees, um, we've seen some, some issues there. Uh, so what would a pay structure look like for bus drivers uh, and what would that do uh, taking us forward? Uh, could we continue the substitute plan? Uh, and we would just have to be mindful like we're with our other substitutes, how many hours they can work uh, because there's more constraints around driving a bus uh, and using a CDL than just, uh, than just substituting a classroom. Uh, and then some partnerships, uh, we, uh, I was, uh, working with our community and then Coconino Community College. Uh, they are bringing online a uh, CDL class. Uh, so myself uh, and Helene, our, our transportation director, are going to meet with uh, the Coconino Community College. They start a new class here pretty soon. And what would it look like to take a brand new person in that class, move them through that, and then be able to say at the end of the CDL, you would have a job with Page Unified School District if you chose to uh, become a bus driver with us. So those are some of the things we've got going on. Uh, we're, our target is 17 bus drivers for the short term, and then the long term we're looking at 20 to 25 uh, fully working bus drivers. Board members. All I know is this has always been a challenge, and uh, there's a. It looks like you, you, you're swimming down a lot of different lanes now, which is good and and uh, kind of outside the box that we've seen. And just tell Larry, I, I almost uh, missed the bus that we used to park out near the stop stoplight that said, "We are hiring bus drivers." <laughs> and we had a banner right all the way across the bus. But anyway, th this looks good, Terry. That'll, uh, and just, just for, that'll be rolling out pretty shortly. Oh, okay. Okay. I was we're, missing it. I was missing we to find it. The, we we're looking for the sign, sir. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Good. Uh, any other comments? Just keep working, man. I tell you what, it's, uh, it's coming up. So thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. All right. uh, next thing up, review of policy, BAA discussion. And again, as you know, October is our evaluation period. And, and uh, Mr. Wallen, you're on the button for this? Or more uh, yes, discussion sir. for the board? Uh, just to, to start off the discussion, one of the things I'd like to do is to take your, um, the board self-evaluation and turn that into a Google Doc so that um, we can then send that to you. You can sit down and and push the buttons of as exceeds meets and needs more work. And then it will automatically tabulate all this as oh, like yeah. some of the things like you heard Ryan say, uh, that was really my piece was to oh. put this together and computerize this so that's much easier to do and, um, and then proceed with that process. And if the, if the boards uh, doesn't have a problem with that, I'll go ahead and, and ask our um, highly competent uh, data analysis person to go ahead and <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's your data analysis person looking at you, saying, "You got to be kidding me!" No. <laughs> and put this into a Google survey. <laughs> all right, very good. You want to you want to save us all that ciphering? I do. Okay, good. Yeah, we were we were ciphering way too much. <laughs> uh, any other comments, board members? And so, do you understand what he's saying? Just put, just computerize this whole thing. This is a tool we've used before, and. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm, everyone's saying, okay, let's get done with this meeting. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. all right. Yes. I, I don't see any other comments, so let's go ahead and, and move on. Uh, thank you so much. Appreciate that. So, uh, board says, let it be done. Uh, item a, I mean, I Navajo technical university, IGA, Mr. Wallen, uh, Mr. President, members of the board, this is to, uh, ask the board at your October meeting to approve an IGA for dual enrollment with Navajo Technical um, College, and we want to do we want to create um, Navajo government and Navajo language as college level courses, mm -hmm. so that the students again have that hook to move down that 
that chief manual to path. And so it's just, it's, it'll be that agreement. And that's the two, two pieces in there that we want to uh, add at this point. Now, there may be other courses down the road that we want to put in that, um, that uh, dual enrollment program. So that, again, that's one of the things I've tasked the high school support staff with is increasing the number of kids who are graduating with their uh, first year of college completed. And then even beginning to look at graduating kids who have the first two years of college completed as we go along. And the nice thing, and the reason we went to uh, Navajo Technical University is because uh, they don't charge any fees for the kids to take the uh, government class and the um, um, Navajo language class. And our teacher is on board. He's getting his credentials ready so that he can, he'll be a part of that, that dual enrollment process. Thank you. So they'll be able to take it here. Correct. I mean, it'll be uh, in, in class or uh, types or online. Either yes, way. Yes, correct. Yes. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Uh, good, good find, good get. I think this is really, really important for our kids. So thank you so much. Appreciate it. Uh, item J, discussion, reopening of school, COVID-19 update, and uh, the, well, the need for the special meeting on September 28th, Mr. Wellen. Uh, Mr. President, members of the board, I'm sharing with you, first of all, uh, my most recent COVID Coconino County Schools update uh, in, in preparation for as we make decisions along. And this is based on, as you can see here, the governor's three metrics uh, that have been established. And you can see that we're in the green uh, for PAGE um, as we move forward. Now, we also did a uh, webinar today, or I'm sorry, yeah, virtual I guess it's a virtual um, hour. Every Monday, what's today? Tuesday. Every Tuesday, I do a one hour uh, virtual uh, conversation with the Navajo Division of Education, Diné Education. And today, um, we also, that and that comes into this uh, data as well as we look at that. And I'm sorry to say that right now, the report is that the, um, the, the, uh, what's it? Positivity is up, uh, and that the 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 spread is up. And so, uh, I'll know I'll have this report uh, Tuesday from the county. Uh, they give us one every week. And so, if you go down and look, you can see that uh, this was August 30th. So we're still missing. While it says September 18th, uh, we've got data ending up with September 12th. And so, this is one of the one of the metrics that we'll be using and. And uh, Thursday, I believe it, Wednesday, when do we, Friday, when do we meet the CWC? Friday. 25th, when we meet with the CWC, this is again, we'll have more current data to, to uh, review with them as well as data from the Navajo Nation in relation to that. Uh, we are aggressively pursuing a um, return to school plan uh, based on what's happening. And I have to, uh, yeah, so let me stop sharing. And then let me go back and share the, the next one. Um, and we met all day Friday. And as you know, we've been uh, meeting and meeting and meeting and meeting on this and, and it continues to be revised every day as we go forward. Um, but as our on-site support has increased, we're running about 70 to 75 students in on-site on support on-site support per the governor's order. Um, we are looking at, at the effect of that and how that's working. So I tasked my security director, uh, Josh, to go over and watch what those guys are doing and replicate that a thousand times. Because when we actually re uh, return to campus and go to campuses, we need to do the same process, the same check-in process, the same temperature checks, and so on and so forth. So this is kind of the, the pathway to the B district and connections to reopening schools. So September 3rd, we met with the CDC and one of the critical pieces is they said, if you come back to school, we believe it might be good to look at 50% of the students present on, a, on any given day. And so then on September the 11th, uh, we met and we began to plan on September 18th. Uh, we're still planning, uh, looking at more pieces September 22nd, that was the instructional leadership team. September 
Second is this work study session. And then we've got meetings planned uh, September 24th. We're going to be meeting with our uh, Navajo chapter officials uh, to look at this. And we're going to have a presentation by Dr. Hugh, who is the pediatrician from Tuba City IHS. And I just uh, was emailing with her back and forth today. One of the areas that I want her to talk about and we want to stress to everyone is how to protect your family, how to prepare your family to come to school. You know, now we need those self checks to be taking place at home uh, as a relation to that. And so then we meet with the CDC um, the 25th. Then I am requesting that we continue that with that we definitely have that September 28th uh, governing board meeting where we look strictly at the reopening plan and what that's going to look like. Um, we had originally suggested October 6th as a possible reopening date. Reopening date. Uh, with our meeting Friday, when we looked at very broad details, um, we wrote another 17 page document on reopening, done great work by um, Josh, uh, our security director, and uh, Brian Henderson, a phenomenal person who put together a checklist. Uh, so we met all day working on that, and we came up with this plan that we will be fleshing out in more detail for you to consider with an opening date of October 12th. And if, depending on our guidelines, if it was, if today was October 12th, I would say, no, we're not gonna open. The trends are up in a lot of areas. Arizona's now gone back up to a red state. Uh, and so, but that's three weeks away. So we need to watch and see where that goes. Uh, we are also at this point, um, and I thought I put that in here, do, 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 do. We are conducting, a, mm -hmm. oh, did I share it? Yeah, okay. Um, we are also conducting another survey of our families, a very aggressive survey to say, do you wanna return virtually? Do you wanna return online? Do you wanna return hybrid? And so the proposal that we're considering recommending the board looks like this. And what we're saying is we wanna come back in a hybrid Fan, um, hybrid model respecting the 50% capacity that the CWC came, uh, came in with, but also the fact that we're down some bus drivers. And so we looked at a plan that says we would come back uh, Monday, Tuesday would be A group and C group. Uh, they would be on site where uh, B and D group would be virtual. Wednesday would be virtual deep cleaning day as a result of two days of occupancy in the building. And then Thursday and Friday would be B group and D group would be fully on site while A and C group would be virtual. So what that means is you would have the opportunity to have three days of virtual and two days of on site in, in, uh, in a week's time, if that's the way we end up putting that together. So the groups look like this. Uh, group A would be all the students living along Highway 98, Route 16 and 21, which we, uh, based on our student information system, believe is about 492 students. Uh, group B would be Coppermine, Lachi, Greenhaven, Wallweep, and Highway 89, which would be about 491 students. Then we, were, we are working on a division of Group C and D, and that's in town, uh, and that's 1,351 students. I'm told that... <laughs> There was a street, and I don't remember the name of it, that used to separate Desert View and Lakeview when they were K-5 each. You remember the name? Arrow. What is it? Arrow. Barrows or something? Arrow. Uh, as a possible demarcation line to divide the in-town students in group C's and D using that same demarcation that was in effect when Desert View and Lakeview were um, K-5s. And so putting that together and looking at what this would look like and detailing it out even further. We met again today to discuss this and we're continuing to, to uh, aggressively pursue planning. The issue is if we don't plan, we won't get there. But the issue is if we're gonna get there, we've got to plan. And so they go hand in hand. I'm not guaranteeing to you that I would recommend that on October 12th, we start school. But right now, based on the metrics, they, uh, yesterday, <laughs> I was pretty positive about it, but today as I've got new additional information, I'm not so positive about it, but we'll see where it goes. So September 22nd through the 25th, 
we will be doing a survey that is being emailed out to the community, to parents. It's on um, the website, it's on uh, School Messenger, it's on all kinds of venues to get out. And then we have a team of teachers and staff that are gonna be working in the afternoons during the 22nd, 25th, following up on people who have not responded to the survey. So our goal is to get as many responses as we can. Our goal is to get 100%. Uh, but and so we're going to do everything we can to get that information out to so that, that parents can understand uh, we can get their preferences and then we'll see if our 50% model is gonna is gonna balance out with what's happening and always understand that basically <coughs> excuse me that virtually you can always maintain virtually if I'm a parent who I want my kid home with me the whole time I want to say ultra safe, then they can be virtual five days a week um, or they can come two days a week uh, to school. Um, so that that's kind of the model. If they wanna to go totally distant learning, then Sage and Sam would be the, the choice that they could follow six through 12. So that's some of the things that are looking out there, but always remember, uh, and, and I say this over and over again, because it's, it's not something we're used to, is if you want to keep your child virtual, please do so. Uh, you don't have to send them back to school unless you're you're um, prepared to do that. And so we'll have by the um, 28th, we should have the survey data as additional data points to look at. We will have a new county school update, as I showed you before, and then we'll have a new update from the Navajo Nation. I know today they're going back into lockdown, right, on the weekends. Yeah, and the, I had Abraham do the meeting for me today because I was in a planning session here. And they said uh, that the president's going to put them back into full lockdown on the weekends uh, and some more restrictions like that to get back and mitigate the circumstances. If you're watching the news, you see that Arizona is, is uh, moving uh, into a spread and uh, as, as back as a red state right now. So uh, again, to be planning and be moving forward with everything. Uh, at the 28th meeting, I'll have uh, a checklist that is like we put together show you that all the stuff that we're doing to get ready for um, for school. And we'll also have the handbook that we've also going with that checklist. So this is what I want you to think about between now and the 28th. Uh, talk to people, look at it. And if, if, the, if the model's unclear, then come and see me or any of the principals. We all participated in developing this. Um, and this would probably continue till January. And then in, in December, we would reevaluate, do we wanna come back fully on board on, you know, on, on the ground kind of a thing. Uh, so we're anticipating that this would run possibly from October 12th. It could run from I mean, the whole year, depends on, you know, there's always rumors out there of, of vaccinations and all that kind of stuff, but it could run even the whole year. But right now we're looking at a 50% capacity hybrid model to move forward with questions I can answer for you. I'll probably talk too fast too. Board members. Okay, I don't see anybody uh, responding, but uh, this is gonna, this is, he made, he made this very concise. And as he said, on the 28th, we'll get the full plan uh, so that uh, we can we can see everything laid out. But uh, once again, great job by the staff to put things together because uh, I know you guys have been working really, really hard in addition to the other things that they're doing. Uh, so appreciate that a lot. All right. Uh, last item, future district newsletter articles. And I just, I wanted to put this on here just because in the last newsletter, I didn't see any, any article by the board. And uh, Lynn had given us a plan and uh, we've run right by that plan and just haven't even listened to it because I do think it's important, and I think we all do, that the that, that board has an opportunity to express themselves concerning your thoughts on the school and various things like that and, and, in, and a lot of encouraging words and things. So anyway, uh, and Lynn, are you, are you there? Are you on somewhere? You're she not on, you're muted. She's well, that's a, first, that's a first time she's muted. No. <laughs> so Ed's going to take the November. Yes. All right, good. And he'll share that out at the October study session. 
Right. And somebody needs to take the October newsletter. Okay. Uh, um, Mr. President, I... also, I'm sorry. Also, if you want to do a video, we can set you up to do a video versus right. writing. If anybody uh, would so, like to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Sandra. Go ahead, Sandra. Oh, no, it's fine. I just, I don't know. Do we have to have something from a board member every single month? Absolutely. What? Yes. <laughs> we want to hear well, from just you, one Sandra. board member. <laughs> that means that you might have, you might put something in twice, twice. in a year. Okay, but the the whole page thing, I it mean, I don't know. I don't know about you, but I you I know you and I differ in opinion on this. Yeah. But when when I write a piece, I want it to be highly polished. Yeah. And that takes hours and hours of time. Yeah. And um yeah. Start so, working on new, new start working on your newsletter for Christmas. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> and remember, Ms. Kidman, remember we have a public relations person. Who is an English major and a published author, and uh, yeah, you had no, on, I, no, I he can help you that. polish it up. I realize that, but even so, I don't, you know, I don't know. Maybe we could do. We want to maybe coordinate topics that we want to talk about. No, we could. I mean, that's up. That's up to the board. You know, that's I don't up know. To I, I I personally struggle when somebody says, "Just write an article." There Let's make go. a video. You know? Let's do a video. Uh, no. <laughs> see there you go hey uh you know again it's uh, this isn't a mandatory thing but i uh i think we should have somebody from the board you know in a in a column or a video or something like that uh because we are part of the we are part of the population oh yeah and, no i'm and, not and, i and, i uh, like i like the overall idea and good. i think um I, I have enjoyed the articles I've read from my fellow board members. Yeah, so we Good totally job. agree. So no, I'm not in disagreement. I'm just <laughs> okay. I'm just questioning the frequency, the length, yeah. and the topics of the articles. That's all. That's up to the author. I mean, if you want to write one paragraph, or if you want to do a little short video, uh, and you work that out with Steve as well. So I mean, you know, you have full latitude in terms of that. Uh, and I can give you. Okay, well, that's good to know because yeah. last time I was told, I need, um, you need to run an article by this time, and it has to be a minimum of this many words. Now that and I was like, and I was like, okay, I'm back in college, so no yeah. thanks. Yeah. You know? Now see, that doesn't sound like anything I would say. <laughs> no, I didn't say it was you. Oh, okay, just checking. <laughs> I, I can give you lots of topics. <laughs> see, okay. there you go. See, yeah. okay, that's my point, I guess, is if I need to know how much do I write, by when do I write it, and kind of a topic, because just kind of pulling, I don't, I I would like a little more. That's yeah, totally in your basket. Like a little more cohesion, even, you know, that I thought that when we, you know, we're supposed to have, every time I go to these ASBA seminars, I, I hear yeah. this, you're supposed to have a communication strategy. What? Well, yeah, you know, okay. we're supposed to be shooting in the same direction, going in the same direction. Sure, sure. So if I just write some crazy off the my head kind of article that mm -hmm. has nothing to do with anything, it doesn't really serve a purpose. That's there, you're point. you're you're muted. You're muted. There, I would be had, happy to work with you on that because I, as I've talked with you, I can see some great topics that you that would really appeal to parents. Uh, oh, but but yeah. what I what I'd like to do to to clarify a lot of this is Lynn has a process that that with she actually laid in front of us and we said yay that's the way should, we should do it. So uh, Lynn, if you wouldn't mind, let's refresh the board and it it should be on the board agenda for a work study session. That's where we have the discussion in terms of who's going to do what. And uh, and that kind of thing. So, but nobody's forcing anybody to do anything. Okay, let's put it let's put it that. And uh, but anyway, I just think it's it's great uh, to hear from the board. So uh, everyone wants to hear what you guys have to think and say. And that's a that's a good uh, it's a good place to do it. Okay. So Lynn, you'll do that for us. 
And I see her shaking. I think that's you behind the mask. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other comments on that? And we'll just uh, have her put that schedule and we'll have a conversation uh, when that's up and ready to go. Well, we are at the favorite part of our agenda. I make a motion to adjourn at oh. 729. Oh. And I second that motion. Motion and second. All in favor say aye, 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 aye. aye. Okay, thank you very much. We are adjourned. And